امام زمانہ بلاتر صلوات اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین الحمد للہ اللہ لہو ما فی السماوات و ما فی الارض و لہو الحمد فی الاخرت و هو الحکیم الخبیر و الصلاة و السلام علی المبعوث الى کافت الورا بشیرا و نذیرا و داعیا الى اللہ بی اذنه وسراجا منيرا ابي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى اهل بيته ائمه الهدى ومصابيح الدجا الذين اذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كتاب أنزلناه إليك مبارك ليدبروا آياته وليتذكر أولو الألباب صلوا على محمد الله محمد الله respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu Alaikum Rahmatullah. Often we hear about the importance of contemplating and doing tadabbur on the Quran. But many times we are not given any practical advice as to how we should go about doing this tadabbur and contemplation on the Quran. So tonight I thought that I would address this issue and talk about, as you heard, a practical guide to doing tadabbur and contemplating on the verses of the Qur'an. And so I've called the title of this lecture the ABCD of contemplation on the Qur'an, a practical guide. And the ABCD really is a mnemonic that I've devised, just a, a tool to help us to remember the four stages that we need to do when we want to engage in tadabbur and contemplation on the Qur'an. And when we look at this, we see that actually it is something extremely important, which is told to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself in the Qur'an. So in Surah Sa'd, verse number 29, which is the verse I recited just a few moments ago, Allah talks about why it is so important to contemplate on the verses of the Quran. He says, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayk, referring to Rasul al Azam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says that it is a blessed book that we have revealed to you. And then he gives the reason why this book has been revealed to the Holy Prophet. So this really is the aim of the revelation. So that they, meaning mankind, does contemplation, they reflect, they ponder over its verses. So from this we learn that actually one of the aims of sending down the Qur'an was so that we contemplate over its verses. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, وَلِيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ And so that the أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ they are the ones who possess intellect. They take admonition. They take warning. So from this, we can get at least three important points about contemplation. First of all, Allah is saying it is one of the aims of revealing the verse, uh, revealing the Quran to you, O Holy Prophet, in the first place. So that people, mankind, contemplates over its verses. So, one of the aims of the revelation of the Qur'an is tadabbur. Secondly, what does Allah mention first? Does He mention tadabbur first or does He mention tadakkur first? He says, لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِ وَلِيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ First, He mentions tadabbur, contemplation. Then, He mentions tadakkur admonition and getting warning from the Qur'an. So when we look at it like this, Allah tells us the Ulul Albab, those who possess intellect, 
They are the ones who take warning from the Quran. Fine. But before the Ulul Albab take warning from the Quran, they must do Tadabbur. Tadabbur comes before Tazakkur. So this is another very important point for us to bear in mind. Thirdly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that who must do Tadabbur? He doesn't just limit it to one people or to one time. He says they, so that they do Tadabbur. Who are they? They are all of us. It refers to the whole of mankind. So that from the beginning of Revelation on the night of Qadr, and until the end of time, people must always constantly do tadabbur on the Qur'an. So this is telling us in a very important point that the Qur'an doesn't just have one meaning that was revealed at the time of the Holy Prophet on the night of Qadr. And that's it. Everything that we needed to know was, it has been known. There's nothing new to be known. That's not the point here. Because if that was the point, it would mean that Allah's instruction is pointless. Why would Allah say, all mankind for all time must do contemplation on the Quran if everything that was to be known about the Quran had already become known? It doesn't make sense for him to say, all mankind must do tadabbur. What is this telling us therefore? This is telling us that the Quran has messages for you and I today. In this time, in this place, just like it had messages at the time of the Holy Prophet in, this, in 7th century Arabia, just as it will have messages for future generations as well. If we look at it like this, we see that the Quran is a dynamic book. It's a relevant book to our lives. It's a book of guidance which is living. It is not a dead book that was revealed at one time and that's it. It applies to all of us. Otherwise, Allah would not say that it is a book on which all of mankind must do tadabbur. So bearing this in mind and of course the fact that we are tonight going to do the A'mal of the 23rd night of Ramadan, which we regard as having the greatest probability of being the night of Qadr, being the night of revelation of the Quran itself, I thought that it would be appropriate to discuss this topic on this particular evening. How we can do tadabbur and contemplate on the verses of the Quran in a very practical way. So, as I mentioned earlier, there will be four steps and each one of these four steps, I've devised this tool for memorizing the four steps, a mnemonic, A, B, C, D, each one of these letters stands for the first word of each step. It's just something that it can help us remember them whenever we open the book and whenever we read the verses of the Quran. The four steps start with what we should do before we even open the Quran. Then there are two steps to do with when we're reading the Quran. And the final step is after we have closed the Quran. What do we do then? I would always recommend, of course, that as we are going through these steps, when we are doing the practical guide, we should always try our best to also get guidance from the ulama. Always try to get guidance from our elders, those who are more versed in the Quran than we are. So it's okay having this guide whenever we, are, we want to read the Quran, we are doing this tadabbur, it's very good. But always try to get advice as well from the ulama, from other books and from scholars who can really help us in this task. So the very first step, A. A stands for appreciation appreciation of the book that we are reading. So this is one step that we should have before we even open the book. We have not opened the Quran yet. Just we should think, what is this book? What makes it different to all other books? So when we ask ourselves these questions, these are very powerful tools to help us focus. When we look at people who are involved in organizing programs, to motivate people, to get people to do things. They use certain techniques. One of the techniques is to ask questions to ourselves. So here there's a key question. The key question is, what makes this book different to all other books? 
So in order to help us answer this, let's ask ourselves, what is the Qur'an? Well, the Qur'an of course is Kalimatullah. It is the word of Allah. This is what makes it different to all other books. In Surah, in, in Surah At-Tawbah, verse number 14, Allah tells us, what he, uh, uh, he tells us that it is the, the book Kalimatullah al Ulya. The word of Allah, it is the greatest of all words. It is the greatest of speech. So Allah's book is Kalimatullah, Kalamullah, the speech of Allah. Now, why do we look at it like this? It tells us so much that when we are reading the book, what is happening then? If you say something is the speech of Allah, something is the word of Allah, that means when we are reading it, Allah is talking to us. At that time, at that very moment we are reading the verses, Allah is talking to us. He is telling us things. Sometimes, unfortunately, these words, these, this speech, it does not sit in our hearts. We hear it, we recite it, but it does not sit in our hearts like it should. And I'll explain why. There are some reasons behind that. So, the first thing, we A for appreciation. We appreciate the book. It is the word of Allah. You know, our sixth holy Imam, Imam Jafar Sadiq <laughs> He tells us how he would think about the book. You know, when he would recite the verses of the Quran in his namaz, sometimes he would lose consciousness. And then after he gained consciousness, the people would ask him, Oh Imam, why did you lose consciousness? And he would say that I was repeating the verses of the Quran so much that it was as if I could hear them being spoken by the one who revealed them. Meaning I, it was as if I could hear the real speaker of the Quran, the original speaker of the Quran. It's not you and I. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was as if I could hear Allah talking to me. That's when he would lose consciousness. So when we look at the book like this, and inshallah when we read the three surahs this evening, and we do the a'mal of the Quran on our head, we do tawassal to the Quran, we seek intercession from it, we can see it in a different light. It is Allah speaking to us right then. Secondly, to appreciate the Quran, let's ask ourselves, what is the aim of this book? Again, it's different to all other books. The aim of the book is Huda Linnas wa bayinatin min al-Huda wal Furqan. In Surah Baqarah verse 185, it is guidance for the mankind and it is a book of clear proofs and guidance and a criterion. It is Furqan, criterion that distinguishes haq from batil, truth from untruth. What is valid, what is invalid. So, which other book is there like this? There is no other book like this. So when we look at it like this, it is Kalamullah, it is a book for our guidance. We begin to appreciate, even before we begin to open it, how great this book is. Also on the A, when we want to read the book, before we open it, there are some practical things we can do. One of the things we can do to get us into the right frame of mind before we start doing the actual tadabbur is we choose a quiet time and a place for doing the contemplation. It's no good doing it at any time. When we're very busy, when there's too much noise around us, that's not going to help us do tadabbur. So quiet time and place. Another thing we can do is make sure we are not very tired. If we're too tired, we're reading and we're dozing off, it's not going to help. Third thing, we should do tadabbur with a light stomach. That means we should not be too full, but neither too hungry. If we are too hungry, then all we're thinking about is food. So, and if we're too full as well, we feel sleepy, we feel lethargic, we won't be in the mood. So a light stomach. Fourthly, we need to have wudu when we do contemplation. This helps us. It acts as a type of spiritual shield against some satanic influences. Another tip is to make sure that we start slowly. 
We don't have to try and, you know, read through many, many verses all at once. Read a few verses. Read one verse even. Read part of one verse. Start slowly and then gradually increase. Sometimes a verse can be split into many parts. One part sometimes is enough for us. <coughs> Another point, facing the Qibla. This is also very important. It helps us to do tadabbur better. And finally, avoiding sins. This is so important. Sometimes if we have sinned before doing tadabbur, it's not going to be effective. We are not going to be able to contemplate very well. Because the Quran tells us itself that sins act as a type of barrier. In the chapter which is named after Rasulul Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, verse number 24, Allah tells us this, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَكْفَالُهَا He says that, why don't they contemplate on the Quran, tadabbur on the Quran, or are there locks on their hearts? What does this mean, locks on their hearts? These locks refer to our sins. The sins act as locks and barriers for receiving inspiration from Allah. When we do tadabbur, we want to gain messages from Allah, isn't it? We want to gain guidance and advice from Him that how we can implement certain things in our lives. If we have been sinful, then it acts as a lock. I'll give you an example. If you take a solar panel, a solar panel, what does it do? It, it absorbs light and the sun's rays so that it can transform this, the, the rays of the sun into energy for that building, for that device, whatever it might be. If we were to cover the solar panel with a thick blanket or with something else that acts as a barrier to the sun's rays coming to the solar panel, it would not be able to absorb the rays, it would not be able to transform them into energy for the building to use. Our souls are like that. It's just like a solar panel. If it is clean, if it is without any barrier, then it can absorb the inspiration, the messages, the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the sun's rays that come to our hearts, to our souls. But if we sin, then these act as barriers. It's like that blanket that's placed on top of the solar panel. If we sin, we are unable to make use of the guidance. The guidance is coming, just like the rays. Can anybody say that the rays are not shining today? Yeah. They are always shining. It's just that there's a big thick blanket over the solar panel. The panel is unable to make benefit from the rays. It's like our souls. Allah's guidance is always there. He's always speaking to us. He's giving us messages and guidance. But if we are sinful, the verse tells us they are like akfal. They are like kufals. Akfal is plural of kufal, which is lock. There are locks on our hearts and we are unable for our bodies then, just like the building, the body is unable to use that energy to get closer to Allah. It acts as a barrier and we are unable to transform that energy for the rest of our body. Muhammad wa Muhammad. So this is A, appreciation. When we appreciate the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His words, His speech, we approach the Qur'an in a much better way. The B of this program stands for being familiar. With what? With the meanings of the verses. So now, we need to ask ourselves that, first of all, which verses do we try and understand? Because for understanding the verses of the Qur'an, we need to choose which verses we are going to understand. So now, when we do this, we want to first of all see what is Allah saying to us in the Quran, isn't it? What does He say? Well, in order to understand what He says, we need to target certain verses. So, we see some problems that arise in our lives. We see, for example, that like yesterday I was talking about resisting temptation 
So, yesterday I spoke about those verses 23 and 24 of Surah Yusuf. They give us guidance as to how we can resist temptations. Those four practical points I put forward. So what we do is, we try and focus on the problems that we are facing. Then, we select verses based on those problems. So if it's resisting temptation, we find out verses about that topic. If it's Ghiba, we look at Surah Hujarat. It tells us that Ghiba is like eating the flesh of your dead brother. Whatever it might be. So for this, we need to now look at what the verses are saying. So in order to select the verses, there are a number of things we can do. There's a concordance of the Quran. This is like an index of the Quran. There's a book published, it's called Concordance of the Quran, published by Tahrik Tarsil Quran. And it is based on the Shakir, English translation of by Shakir. And I know, Alhamdulillah, there are some members of the community that have also been working on indexes of the Quran. Alhamdulillah, may Allah give them tawfiq to do even better work and more work for the sake of Allah, inshaAllah. So that's one way. Another way, simply going online. If you just type in backbiting in the Quran, it'll give you all the verses. If you type in, for example, financial difficulties and then Quran. You type in, for example, resisting temptation. You type in marriage. Whatever the problem happens to be, you'll find many articles and many pages about that. Another way is to have apps. These days, there are so many great apps about the Quran. So many software programs we can install on our computers. There's very many, many ways. There's a huge amount of ways we can find out verses about the Quran. Then we must look at how we can understand this. Now, this involves some studying. We have to always study the Quran. There's no other way. We have selected our verses now, but we have to find out the meaning. The minimum we should do is look at the translation. After that, look at tafsir, ask scholars. Again, we can look on the internet. There are tons and tons of pages about the Quran, about verses, about tafsir. But of course, I would just mention a point of warning here. There are so many pages, sometimes it's difficult to spot the right ones. And not all of them are in accordance with our beliefs. So we have to be careful when we look at the internet. So here again, ask the ulama for advice, ask scholars, make sure that they are authentic pages, pages that are in line with our beliefs. So when we do this, we will now get a good understanding. Remember the B is being familiar with the meanings of the Quran. Now sometimes people ask this question, that Sheikh, you're talking about contemplation, what about when we just read the Quran like that? Fast. We read it for thawab. We read it in Ramadan. We read it just for improving our tajweed, our makharij and pronunciation of the letters and words and verses. Isn't that enough? How about that? Can, should we always engage in tadabbur? Well, the answer is, if somebody can do both, then that's nur ala nur, right? That's even better. But we can always have two or more recitations of the Quran going on at the same time. So, for example, we can have one recitation of the Quran, which is at a quite a fast pace. We are just reciting the Quran for thawab, for reward. The Quran is not like any other book, like we were examining earlier. Other books, if you don't understand what they are saying, they are really pointless. Right? What's the point of reading a book if you don't understand what it's saying? The Quran is not like that. We should still read it, even if we are not doing tadabbur, even if we are not engaging in looking at the meanings at that time. It still has a great effect on us. It still is, has lots of reward for us actually reading the Quran just like that even if we don't understand it it is still ibadat it is still the worship of Allah so we should read it yes for thawab improving our tajweed improving our fluency improving our makhraj and pronunciation of the words that's great but then 
we can keep a different marker for that reading, the fast reading, and a different one for when we do tadabbur. Yeah. We can have maybe two different colored markers, two different bookmarks. So one which is a very fast one, one which we are going slowly through in our own time with contemplation, looking at the meaning and contemplating over the verses, looking at tafsir. Let me illustrate this with this wonderful story. It's from Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. You must have heard of him. He was this famous Muslim scholar. Look what he says. He says that he has this book. It's called Adab, Adab Kitab al Adab Tilawat al Quran, a book on the etiquettes of Quran recitation. In this book, he says that a great Sufi type of person, a mystical master, right, and like an Arif came to him and told him how he does his recitation. You know what he says? He says that there are times when I complete the Qur'an every Friday. MashaAllah, if only we could complete the Qur'an every Friday. Then he says that there are other times when I complete the Qur'an every month. Then he says that there are times when I complete the Qur'an every year. And, there are, and then he says, there is one Qur'an recitation that I've been trying to complete for the last 30 years, but I've still not completed it. So what is this telling us? This is telling us that there are different ways and different speeds at which we can read the Qur'an. So when he says, I sometimes complete it every week, every Friday, it means very fast, with less contemplation. Every month, a bit more. Every year, much more. And then he has one reading of the Qur'an which he has not completed for 30 years. Meaning this is the one that he is contemplating on the most, slowly, with deep reflection and pondering. So my brothers and sisters, and I remind myself first and foremost, this is something that we can do. We can read the Qur'an at different speeds and at different depths of contemplation. So Allah, Muhammad, Muhammad. Allah, Allah, Muhammad. Allah, Allah, so that's the B. So A, appreciation of the book before we even open it. B, we have now opened it and we want to be familiar with the meanings of the verses. C, the C stands for closeness to Allah by applying the verses to our lives. This is the most critical part of this four-step program. Closeness to Allah. So what we do here, again, we ask ourselves this question, how, what does Allah want us to do to get closer to Him? This is the key question during this third part. What does Allah want us to do to get closer to Him? And we will see that we will get answers, we will get messages from Him. So for this, what we need to do is to make sure that we are contemplating on certain things. Now, for this, what we should do is take an interactive approach. This is extremely important. Our recitations of the Quran sometimes are not interactive. We need to engage with the words of Allah. Remember we said it is Kalimatullah. It is the word of Allah. It is Kalamullah, the speech of Allah. He is talking to us. When we want to engage in a conversation, conversation is a two-way process. He is talking to us, but we need to interact with His words. How do we interact? We can use a very powerful tool, again, it's called visualization. We visualize, we picture certain things. So, when we are reading the Quran, we will come across some verses which are known as verses of Rahmah, verses to do with the mercy of Allah. Other times, we will come across verses which are verses of Ghadab, verses of Allah's wrath and punishment. Now, when we come to those verses of Rahmah, let's interact, let's visualize. We put ourselves in that picture. So when Allah is talking about heaven, we put ourselves in that picture, we picture ourselves there. We picture ourselves as being those people who Allah describes as receiving His Rahmah. And we say to ourselves, we make a dua at that time, Oh Allah, make us amongst those who are receiving this type of Rahmah. 
Make us of those who will be in that position. We make it interactive. We make it something that we visualize. When we visualize things, we simulate how we will get to that position. It is something really remarkable. Automatically, when we start visualizing a dream, some motivation, we automatically will start to work towards achieving that aim. So we visualize it, same with those verses relating to punishment. We make a dua, oh Allah, save us from the hellfire. Make us not amongst those who are going to receive this type of punishment. We make it interactive. Then what do we do? That's the outcomes. We also do the same with the processes. It's okay to put ourselves in that position, but what processes do we need to do to achieve that aim? So we visualize ourselves in that position, we make those to us, but then we ask ourselves, Oh Allah, what do I need to do to get closer to you? Now it's getting very practical. So here, we look at characteristics of certain people in the Quran. Allah talks about those people He is happy with, he talks about those people he is sad with. So, for example, if we have a problem with riba, we look at those characteristics of those who do riba. Like in Surah Hujurat, as I mentioned, they are like those who are eating the flesh of their dead brother. And we say, Ma'az Allah, oh Allah, I'm going to make sure I'm not of that type. Those who are the munafiqeen, we look at their characteristics. How does Allah describe them? And we say, we look at ourselves and we apply it to ourselves and we say this is something that unfortunately I have and I must remove this. We look at those who Allah is angry with. We say no, I have a bit of this. I must remove this from my character. Same thing with those Allah with those people Allah is happy with. For example, he talks about the characteristics of mu'minin. Let's look at those and say, all right, it's a checklist for me. Do I have this one? Do I have this character? Do I have this character? If not, then let me add it to my character. So you see, now the Quran is becoming a very practical guide. It's becoming a very useful manual for all of our lives. Whatever problem we have, we're using it in a very interactive way. So with regards to Mu'mineen, just as an example, in Surah Al-Furqan, this is chapter 25 of the Quran. There are a number of verses which are known as the Ayatul Ibad Rahman, verses 63 to 76. If we get time tonight, let's all try and look at these verses. Chapter 25, verses 63 to 76. The, they are known as the verses of the All Compassionate. Ayatu, the verses of the servants of the All Compassionate, Ayatu Ibad Rahman. They are known by this name because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lists 14 characteristics of His pure and sincere servants. These are known as the Ibadu Rahman, the sincere servants of Ar Rahman, the All Compassionate. The verse starts. وَإِبَادُ Rahman الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا The Ibadu Rahman, first characteristic is that they walk on the earth with humility. Allahu Akbar. This means the first characteristic is that Ibadu Rahman and inshallah we are all Ibadu Rahman but we can always improve of course. We can become better and better Ibadu Rahman. The first characteristic is that they are humble. Their life is a life of humility. And you will see there are 13 other characteristics. It's a brilliant set of verses. The number as well, 14, by the number of the Ma'asumin alayhum as salam Muhammad wa So then we look at it in this way. And then the D, the final step is for doing it. Right? This is the easiest one to understand, but the hardest one to put into practice. D for doing it, meaning now that we have appreciated the book, we have become familiar with its meanings, 
we have tried to get closer to Allah by asking Him, how do we get close to you? And we have applied it to our character. Now He has given us messages. He has given us the guidance we want. He has told us, you must do this, you must do that. You must take this away from your character. You must add this to your character. He has given us all the guidance. But if we don't do it in practice, tomorrow we, we just close the book, tomorrow we go to school, tomorrow we go to work, and we're exactly the same as before, before we did any of this, then it's no use. What's the point of doing all of that or well, very little use? This is the key part, very difficult to put it into practice. What happens is when we put any of this guidance into practice, it acts as a starting point, a higher starting point for future tadabbur. Then when we act on that future tadabbur at a high level, we move up a spiritual level and so on and so forth. It becomes a spiral, an upward spiral of spiritual development. So we do tadabbur, we get messages. We act upon those messages. Next time we do tadabbur, we start at a higher level of spirituality. When we start at a high level, Allah gives us higher guidance. He gives us better, deeper messages. Again, we act on that. Next time we do tadabbur, we at a high level, so on and so forth. We keep on getting higher and higher. You've all heard of Ayatollah Bahjad. He has this, Muhammad Taki Bahjad was this great jurist, philosopher and arif. He says that, because people always used to ask him for advice. I myself, Alhamdulillah, had the tawfiq and I, I know he says this many, many times that I ask those who ask for advice. He says, I ask them a question that have you acted on the advice that you have heard so far? How much advice, how much guidance have we heard? Myself, first and foremost. And the key question he is asking is that, have you acted upon that so far? Meaning that you are always asking for advice, act on what you've already been told. And then he says that, do you know that if somebody acts on their knowledge, Allah makes their unknowns into knowns. Whatever we didn't know, he'll make us know it. In fact, he is simply paraphrasing a hadith from Rasulul Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our Prophet says, Man amila bima ya'lam wa rathallahu ilma ma lam ya'lam. The one who acts on, on what he learns, Allah makes him a warith. He makes him an heir. He makes him inherit knowledge which he did not know before meaning he transfers to him new knowledge he transmits to him new knowledge exactly what I was trying to say the D is about doing when we act on those messages that Allah has given us through the process of tadabbur we rise we act we rise we act and we keep on rising Allah gives us new guidance deeper guidance and we constantly move towards him so as a summary, in this lecture, because it, tonight is the night of Qadr, the greatest probability for it, and I will talk more about that, why we say it has the greatest probability of being the night of Qadr when we do the A'mal. We looked at this practical program for doing tadabbur and contemplating on the verses of the Qur'an, a simple mnemonic to help us remember the four stages, A, B, C, D, a is for appreciation, B is for being familiar with the meanings of the Qur'an, C is for closeness to Allah by applying them to our character and to our lives, and D is for doing it. Let's recite a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, by the right of this night, by the right of Amir al-Mu'mineen, by the right of this month, and all the A'ima alayhi salam, enable us to use the Qur'an as a manual for our daily lives, inshallah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Allah enable us to practically do tadabbur on your verses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Allah forgive us and our forefathers for our sins. O Allah, on this night of Qadr, decree for us what is best for our dunya and our akhirah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. O Allah, there are many people facing difficulty around the world. Bring them relief. 
Our, Allah, our last but not least prayer is that you hasten the appearance of the 12th Holy Imam Ajjallahu Ta'ala for a Jishan.